It's 1972. I'm four years old, and I'm on one of those rare days with my father where it's just me and him. And we have a routine on these days, and this is, this is the best part, because I'm looking over the railings of a hippopotamus, its mouth wide stretched towards me. And my dad ignores my squeals of protest. He picks me up, he lifts me over the railings, and he puts my head inside that open mouth. Now, I know what you're thinking. He wasn't a total psycho. This was a natural history museum, and the hippo was stuffed. <laughs> but, but looking back at that time, I think this was a moment where my passion for wild animals was born, for mammals, and also my fascination with the peculiarities of human happiness. I'm 22. I've been in Africa for a week. I've swapped the perpetual gray, windswept landscape of Wales, and that's on a good day, for the bright sunshine of Zambia. And I'm looking at my first wild lion. All that fascination with mammals as a kid comes flooding back to me. I spend my weeks as a volunteer for the UN, working with groups of very poor women who are working on the roads in the slums around Lusaka, Zambia. They have babies tied to their backs and they're swinging pickaxes as they build drainage ditches and fix up the roads. And I spend the weekends chasing, sometimes being chased by animals. I feel like I'm living in color for the first time. I've been hit over the head with the, the vibrancy, the hardship, the humanity, the happiness that is Africa. It's a wonderful feeling. I've never been as happy. Back in the UK, it's much darker and colder than I remember. It's much smaller and far more crowded. And worse, there are no mammals to look for here. I, I had to leave. Six years later, I'm stepping off a plane in Australia into a new life. I've got things to do before I start work. I need to find a place to live, buy a car, open a bank account. But I've got a much bigger priority. I need to see my first kangaroo. Two hours later, I found one, and it was love at first sight for me in Australia. Now, I'd come to Australia really to pursue my ever more consuming quest to see the world's mammals. There are 300 species there you can't see anywhere else. Um, and when I arrived, I'd thought for the past 10 years that I was the world's only mammal watcher. I met hundreds of bird watchers, frog fanciers, butterfly hunters, but no one else was into mammals. But in Australia, I found a few other people quite quickly who, like me, were interested in mammals. And emboldened by our community, we came out of the shadows and we confessed our love for mammals publicly. And that community morphed into a website I set up 11 years ago, mammalwatching.com, that's now become the hub of a, a global movement of other mammal watchers around the world. <laughs> Now, I also had to, to work in Australia to pay the mammal bills, and I was working as a statistician for the government. And I was besotted with Australia for that first year, particularly. And like any love-struck young man, I was blind to any imperfections. I wanted to sing from the rooftops about how glorious this country was, how beautiful the landscapes were, how warm the people were, how abundant the mammals were. And yet I was puzzled because so much debate of my colleagues at work, in the media, in government, about the country ignored all this. It was just about the health of the economy, the stock exchange, inflation. <coughs> Couldn't they see how wonderful this place was? So I wanted to change this, and I put my hand up to develop a set of progress measures for Australia for the government, a set of KPIs for the country, if you like, that would look not just at the health of the economy, but at the health of society, and the environment side by side. Now, back then in 2000, this was seen as a very risky project for a, a government to take on. But we survived. And when it came out, it was really well received. The, the media loved it. One journalist actually said, we came as close to measuring the meaning of life as any statistician can get. We won a national award. But to be honest, public debate did not change overnight. However, looking back, that project was an important first step in a, in a journey that's taken that stream of work to 
to think about life beyond GDP, from a fringe idea in 2000 to something that is now firmly in the mainstream in many countries. It involves leading thinkers, a bunch of Nobel Prize winners, and politicians from the Prime Minister of Bhutan to Angela Merkel in Germany. They're on board with this. It's taken me around the world and now here to, to the UN in New York, where I think about what development actually means, what it actually means for people. And for me, understanding happiness is a really important part of that. Because if we say we're developing as a nation, but people are no happier, then can we really say we're developing? Now, there are many ways to think about happiness, but one model I like looks at three levels which we can aspire to. At the basic level, we can search for a pleasant life, a life full of positive emotion. Think of my daughter in a Pinkberry frozen yogurt store with $10 to spend. At the next level up, we can search for a good life, a life where we get pleasure from doing things we excel at. Think of LeBron James on a basketball court. And that feeling of being lost in a task that we enjoy and are good at, it's very powerful. We call it flow. It's a very powerful form of happiness. But perhaps the ultimate level of happiness for life is a meaningful life, a life where we strive for a higher purpose. Think of Mandela trying to overthrow apartheid in South Africa. And I actually think that my, my passion for mammals has brought me happiness on all three of those levels. Now, don't get me wrong, there are times when this passion of mine has brought me immense frustration and misery. I remember once I was in southern Thailand. I was sitting in a very uncomfortable tree for three straight days in a stinking hot, festeringly humid swamp. And when I wasn't dealing with the pins and needles in my legs or the mosquitoes that were attacking me, I was wondering, what on earth am I doing? This is completely crazy. But at the 11th hour, just before I had to leave, I saw the world's rarest otter for maybe one or two seconds. And I had this blinding flash of positive emotion, this fist-pumping feeling, and it, life doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> it doesn't. Um, when I'm in a forest walking, trying to see a monkey or a squirrel, every sense is attuned to what's happening around me. I'm lost in that flow, striving to, to understand what's going on around me. But this passion of mine... The, the community I've formed has given my life a higher purpose in some ways. I'm proud of the people that have come together, the community we've formed. I'm proud that the information we share has brought new people into the fold. But perhaps more than anything, I'm proud that the information we've shared has put remote places and people on the map. Villages that once subsisted on the animals in the forest, they had to eat them to survive, now earn a steady stream of income from people like me paying to see the animals, which protects them. And the thought that one day my kids, if I haven't put them off, can see a giant panda in China or a snow leopard in India, that makes me very happy. <laughs>